Okay, so hello everybody. Um, today is vampires, as you know, it's daunting, definitely daunting for me. Um, as usual, it's going to be in three sections. Um, those are my uh, my Twitter handle and the hashtag as usual. So do feel free to, to tweet along or whatever, or contact me if you've got some queries about what I'm going to be saying. Um, I'm using this, art thou still living wretch? And we'll, we'll see that quote coming up later. Um, the early Gothic vampire. So I am going to be staying in my wheelhouse today. Um, I'm going to be predominantly talking about... Um, the, the vampire as it appears in the 18th and early 19th centuries um, and going to have a, be having a look at some of the underlying belief frameworks which are informing the vampire and also some of the kind of traditions and understandings of the vampire which are going into that early gothic vampire. So in terms of the three sections today, the first section is going to be a prehistory of the vampire, going through the different vampire myths and stories which um, had arrived in England in the 18th century. So just to be very clear, what I'm not doing is not offering, I'm not offering a history of the vampire itself. Um, so I'm not looking at like all the different folkloric traditions. I'm looking very specifically at what fed into the 18th century understanding of the vampire. Um, the second section, I'm going to be looking at some of those theological and ideological frameworks of the vampire. Like, what does the vampire mean? How can we interpret it? And how can we put it in the wider context of the Gothic and various different tropes and concerns of the Gothic? And then in the last section, I'm going to be talking about vampires and sex in the early British Gothic, um, which is probably, if any of you were up, well, it would have been a normal human time for some people, uh, but it was up very, very late for me. I was tweeting out some little snippets of that for people. So I'm going to start by go, going back once again to ye medieval times, because there's this idea of the vampire arriving in the 18th century, really in England, with the vampire craze and the Arnold Paul case, which I'm going to get back to later. But what I want to look at is whether there is some sense of a tradition or a particular framework of understanding for discussing the vampire, which already existed in England. And what we do find um, in medieval texts is maybe not a prehistory of the vampire, but certainly um, a sort of prehistory of walking corpses. Um, and so I'm gonna take you through a couple of different examples, a couple of different sources. The first of these is Walter Mapps, the Nugis Curialium Distinctionis Kinke. I don't know how to say any of that. Um, on the trifles of court courtiers, basically is what it means. And uh, written it circa 1182, who knows? And it's one of the earliest, not the earliest, um, because there's some 11th century stuff as well, but one of the earliest uh, tales that we still have extant of what would perhaps be a vampire within this Anglo-Saxon tradition. And the critic that I'm uh, referring to a lot, and I'll just check his name, is Stephen Gordon. So he's a medievalist who um, studies like walking corpses and demons and demon possession and stuff like that. And he notes that there's an Anglo-Saxon tradition of blood drinking and flesh eating demons, which tallies somewhat closely with the vampire. The most obvious example of that would be Grendel from Beowulf, which most of us will probably be familiar with a little bit. Anyway, the story that Walter Mapp tells us is about a vampire in a knight's household. So we start with a marriage, uh, a, a noble knight marrying a virtuous lady, and they have a child. Great, good stuffs, except the day after the child is born, it's found dead and everything is covered with blood. And that happens again, and it happens again. And then they think, maybe we should do something about this. But they don't really seem to do anything about it. But happily for them, a stranger comes to the house. And he says, oh, oh no, that's terrible. Let me help you. I'll, yes, I'll stay up uh, and make sure that nothing happens to the baby. And he's, everybody's staying up, obviously, because they all want to catch this, whatever is doing this, whoever is doing this. But the stranger notices that everybody is starting to fall asleep, but he manages to keep his eyes open. And he sees approaching the cradle, a woman who is about to take and kill the baby, but he gets her. And everyone starts to sort of wake up and uh, go sort out what's going on with this commotion. And she looks like this very virtuous lady of, of good renown from the town. 
Um, but he presses a church key to her forehead and it starts to sizzle and burn. He says, this is no woman. And they go to the house of the woman and they find that she's still there. She does have a weird mark on her, but now there's two of them. There's a double. And so basically there's a demonic double uh, in play here who is then sent away and never comes back. Um, how the defeated isn't made quite clear in this one. And of course, this isn't necessarily quite a vampire tale, but you're getting some of those elements in there. Sort of this demonic, flesh-eating, blood-drinking creature. Now, I'm going to take you a little bit later, just a tiny bit later, to William of Nubra in the Historia Rerum Anglicarum, so the history of Ang uh, English affairs, circa 1198. And he tells us four different vampire stories, which are much more recognizable as vampire stories to us today. Although, of course, he doesn't use the word, because the word obviously postdates this period significantly. Um, the first of his tales is a Buckinghamshire vampire from 1196. So he tells the story of a death. Normal, a gentleman dies, but somewhat more abnormal is that he returns the very same night to his wife, filling her with greatest alarm and almost killing her by leaping upon her. So an interesting aspect of this is cause, of course, is that tally between sleep paralysis and vampiric visions. So there's a lot of different supernatural occurrences, including dreams, incubi and succubi, and vampires, which can sometimes be traced back in terms of the symptoms to sleep paralysis. Um, she creates a big fuss, and the husband stops trying to leap on top of her and goes and visits his brothers instead, starts leaping on top of them, as you do. And they also make a lot of noise to scare him away. And so he just starts appearing just around the day in the village, bobbing about, creating a, a bother, obviously scaring everyone. And so they go and they dig the corpse up and they find that it is incorrupt. So it hasn't rotted. It's still ruddy and, and fresh. And the... Um, people appeal to the bishop and they say, well, look, what we normally do is just chop them up, right? And then burn them. And he's like, oh, it's a bit, it's a bit brutal, that, isn't it? I'll try something different. And so he sends an absolution and they pin the absolution to the chest of the corpse and the corpse does not arise again. So another interesting aspect that I'm pulling out for you here is this idea of um, sort of the religious power over the vampire and perhaps this issue of being unshriven or unforgiven, unconfessed as part of the reason that they become a vampire. Okay, the next story is from the Berwick vampire. This is a little bit more extreme. It's connected to a man who is very clearly evil, the squire of Annick Castle who is a stranger to God's grace and whose crimes were many. And he, um, after his death, is found prowling the streets. And there's various things that suggest that this isn't all right. First of all, he's dead and he's prowling the streets. Second, dogs start convulsively barking when they see him. There's a fetid pestilence and there's a spread of a plague. Now, the learned men, they meet together, like, we really must do something about this. Really, really, really must. But there's some young men who are already busy acting on it. So they, the young men, while the old men are talking, the young men go to the graveyard, they dig up the corpse and they find it, of course, gorged and swollen with frightful corpulence, the face florid and chubby, huge red puffed cheeks and the shroud all soiled and torn. So they decide that something has to be done. They've recognized him as a sanguisuga or a bloodsucker. So he's executed and his body is burnt. So another couple of common tropes there, this appearance of the dead in the coffin is going to become very familiar in the vampire legends that appear in the 18th century as well. Also this connection to a spreading illness and um, this mode of execution. Fire is key to getting rid of vampires, just in case you're ever faced with one. Uh, another two stories from William of Newborough, he's really piling them up. Um, the Hound's Priest, there should be an apostrophe after the F, apologies. So the hound's priest, he was called the hound's priest. He was a chaplain, but he was an irreligious chaplain. And once again, addicted to hunting with hounds. So he dies. He's buried in uh, the holy ground at Melrose Abbey, but the holy ground can't keep him, can't keep a hold. Um, and then he starts to appear at his former mistress's house outside his window. I mean, what is he doing there? Who can say who can tell? And so we have the beginning of a classic medieval joke 
a priest, a monk, and two powerful young men hold a vigil, but it doesn't get very funny, sadly. Only one of them stays. I guess the rest of them got bored, but happily it's the priest. And so when the devil raises up the corpse, the priest is like, I don't think so, Satan, and hits it with a spade. Um, uh, obviously the dead man is wounded and when they dig up the corpse the next day, when they disinter it, they find that the wound is there. So it obviously was him. And once again, cremation is the way forward. The last story, again, quite fun, um, is the ghost of Anantis. So once again, we have a man of ill repute, but this time <laughs> it's, he's still alive at this point. Um, he returned from the wars, wherever he was. He got married, but he's, he's worried about his wife. Is she faithful? And so he's like, I've got a, I've got a dead cunning plan. I'm going to hide in the rafters of the bedroom. So he does. Um, if any of you were with me on Wednesday evening, Queen of the Gam Damned Gift photo, photo there. I knew it would come in useful one day. He's hiding up in the rafters and splat, he falls out of the rafters. Because <laughs> he sees her having sex with another guy and he's like, oh no! <laughs> Um, <laughs> so as he lays broken upon the floor, he's so angry that he refuses to confess or he fails to confess. And so he becomes a wandering corpse as the pestilential stands. There's a plague as usual. And um, this time it's two brothers that come to the rescue and they come and they cut out his heart and then cremate him as usual. So you've got a few different killing methods coming up here, but there's definitely some common features that we're finding. And these are far from the only stories. Um, these accounts also do frequently mention that, these, that such stories are common in the period. To what extent that's true, it's unknowable. Um, <clears throat> but you do have a lot of other sort of medieval and early modern sources about The Walking Dead, such as William of Malmesbury's uh, Witch of Berwick story from the Gesta Pontificum Anglorum, Geoffrey of Burton um, in the Vita Sancta Moderna Virginis, oh my god, why didn't I just translate these, um, is... Uh, it talks about a shape-shifting one where they change into various different animals, which is an interesting uh, part of the later vampire myth, of course, the Chronicon of Lanarkist, the Monk of Byland, uh, and their accounts really do blur the line between the idea of the corporeal ghost and the vampire, which is quite interesting, and the Armberg Papers. And there's a couple of common features here. So is there a sort of prehistory of the vampire in a continuous thread all the way through? No, there isn't. Um, I would argue, but there is um, a sense of an, a medieval and early modern prehistory of the walking dead, which offers already these paradigms for understanding and perhaps offers as well um, for later writers, particularly material to, to take from. And there are common features that are appearing that express something about an understanding of how this living death works. And it's broadly speaking, it's a theological understanding and it's something that's not disappeared by the 18th century as I will discuss at length. So the risen dead are usually uh, evil. They're usually depraved in life. They might be unshriven, um, angry. They, uh, there's quite a, a lot of these cases which are linked with sleep paralysis, um, a common trope later, of course. There's a connection of a fatal sickness with the walking corpse. The state of the corpse itself is ruddy in flesh and often like very bloody as well, with blood on the mouth, for example. Uh, the clergy, half the time the clergy is engaged in this fight and you have obviously the story of the absolution working. Um, methods of eradication are usually at this point just dismemberment or cremation. You've got the removal of the heart, um, but you don't have staking particularly. Um, and there's also this very clear emphasis on demonic agency. So one of the stories from William of Newbury, he says, by the contrivance, as it is believed, of Satan. So you have this sense of the body of the corrupt being able to be animated by the demonic. So that's what you get with the prehistory of the vampire. And now I've said there's not a continuous tradition, but it's interesting when you look at the folk materials and things like folk ballads, such as... Um, the Unquiet Grave, as it's often known. This is a folk song which is very common and very popular today still in the folk community. Um, and it was recorded in the 18th and the 19th centuries. It has a long history dating back to at least the 15th century. And in it, you have uh, certainly a talking corpse with a corporeal aspect to it. So there's a suggestion that perhaps within folk beliefs, you do have a continuing tradition of material ghosts at least. 
Um, so if you look at the third verse, um, it's all about a woman or a man, depending on who's singing and uh, which version you're looking at, because there's lots of different versions. Um, there have been mourning and for 12 months and a day, uh, the dead begins to speak. Who sits weeping on my grave and will not let me sleep? Um, she replies, tis I, my love, sit on your grave and will not let you sleep. For I crave one kiss of your clay-cold lips, and that is all I seek. And the reply, fairly damning, you crave one kiss of my clay-cold lips, but the call of death is strong. If you have one kiss of my clay-cold lips, your time will not be long. There are definitely lots of other versions there. So you crave one kiss of my clay-cold lips, but my, but my breath smells earthy strong. Um... If you were not my own true lovers, I know you well to be. I'd tear you up like leaves upon the tree. <laughs> it's a slightly more threatening version there. But there's this interesting, I think, um, idea, once again, of an infectious death and that link to sensuality, which you'll find later coming out in The Vampire. So that's the um, sort of tradition coming out of the medieval period, early modern period. And there's perhaps some links in folk culture um, there's not that many ballads that I can think of. There's obviously other ones with ghosts, but not necessarily quite as clearly material and with that sort of vampiric infection narrative going on as well. Coming into the early modern period um, and the post-Reformation period, you're not getting this proliferation of vampire stories anymore as you did perhaps in the medieval chronicles. You're getting this shift though to occasional stories and they are being reported as vampires from other places. So it's this, this curiosities of other wear. Um, but as I've noted here, you're also getting them used in anti-Sadducean literature. So if you weren't here last week, I talked about anti-Sadducean literature as part of the, the fight against atheism. Um, where the with collections often of supernatural or spiritual stories which sought to prove the existence of the spiritual realm, the afterlife, the supernatural, as a sort of antidote to uh, disbelief and materialism. So Henry Moore, in his Antidote to Atheism, provides just such a story with a vampire in it. Um, he talks about um, a vampire in Silesia, which is in modern day Poland. And I've just put the chapter headings here because it's basically the whole story. You don't need to read it anymore. Um, but the shoemaker of Breslau killed himself by cutting his own throat. His family hid that fact somehow by saying he had an apoplexy and buried him so that he wouldn't be buried in unconsecrated ground. But he was condemned by this final act. And so he starts to appear going around the town, leaping on people, not his family though. And his family is still in denial. Like, no, 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 totally no died totally normally, it's all fine, it's not him. But after a while, people were getting sick of this, so they dug him up, they found the corpse as usual, very plump, very bloody, very fresh, and they reburied him. And obviously this sort of irritated him because then he started to go after his family as well. And that's when they were like, oh, okay, maybe we should do something about this. So they reopened the grave, they took him out, they dismembered him, they burnt him all sorted except the maid then became a vampire as well and disturbed the town for a while and i've got a little bit of her story here because it's one of my favorite weird vampire stories just put it there before you so it happened in his maid that died after him who appeared within eight days after her death to her fellow servant and lay so heavy upon her that she brought upon her a great swelling of her eyes which is quite the image she so grievously handled the child in the cradle that if the nurse had not come in to his help, he'd been quite spoiled. But she crossing herself and calling upon the name of Jesus, the spectre vanished. The next night she appeared in the shape of a hen. Uh, when one of the maids of the house took to be so indeed and followed her, the hen grew into an immense bigness or immense bigness and presently caught the maid by the throat and made it swell so that she could neither well eat nor drink for a good while after demonic chickens. Uh, obviously some interesting elements there in terms of the shape shifting, in terms of the um, ability of Jesus's name to combat the, the specter, etc. And again, that uh, sort of sleep paralysis narrative. Now, this is where we're moving into the more commonly known and accepted prehistory of the vampire as it appears in the 18th century. So um, we often think of the vampire craze starting in the 18th century with the 1732 publication of the story of Arnold Paul in the London Magazine. Um, but there are sort of um, existing accounts before that which 
tell basically very, very similar stories are relating the same folklore from similar areas of the world. And so one of the first of these was published in 1678, and it's the present state of the Greek and Arminian churches. Now, what's particularly interesting about this is it offers a paradigm for understanding what the vampire is and how it appears, which really provide some of the key tropes of the vampire that we're going to see in the early British Gothic. So it's very clear here. It's associated with the Greek Orthodox Church's practice of excommunication, which the writer Paul Rico says is very widespread, almost overused. But there's this idea that the bodies of those excommunicated are possessed in the grave by an evil spirit, which actuates and preserves them from corruption in the same manner as the soul informs and animates the living body. They feed in the night, walk, digest, and are nourished, and have been found ruddy in complexion, and their veins, after 40 days burial, extended with blood, which being opened with a lancer, have yielded a gore as plentiful, fresh, and quick as that which issues from the vessels of a young and sanguine person. So obviously key tropes of the vampire there. But what's particularly interesting is this connection to excommunication. And there's a lot of writing, you're gonna find it repeated in other accounts that I'm gonna talk about on vampirism from 1823, the writings of Don Augustine Calme, this idea of the vampire linked to narratives of religious othering. So there's obviously here this idea of the sinner who is a Greek Orthodox excommunicate. But it was also part of, according to Don Calme, anyway, a sort of Greek Orthodox propaganda against the Catholic Church as well, um, saying, you know, this is the power of our priests, that if you're not buried in our holy ground, then you're going to raise from the dead, you're excommunicate. Um, and there's, there's a certain aspect of anti-Catholicism going on here, but more, more properly, it's worth looking at it through the lens of this idea of religious othering and theological error. Um, so he gives this general account of what the vampires are accounted to be and then tells us a particular story. Um, so he, he provides it, as we're familiar with, with these narratives of the late, late 17th, 18th century, he's trying to provide a rational account and assess it using um, sort of logic and empiricism where possible. So in this case, it's logic because it's a story being told to him, but he attests to a number of witnesses of repute and um, of expertise. And it's a very, it's a fairly classic case. There was a criminal who was excommunicated. When he died, he appeared again after death, frightening and disturbing the populace with strange and unusual apparitions, such as uh, sitting on their chests at night, as we see at one side, um, but tormenting them. And the family were quite well to do. And they said, well, we don't really want you to do the usual. <laughs> so when they found the body uncorrupt and ruddy and the veins replete with blood, they said, well, please don't do this. Don't cut and dismember the body into several parts and then boil it in wine. We'd like you to treat our relative with more respect than that. So what they do is appeal to the patriarch, the head of the uh, Greek Orthodox Church, for an order of absolution, very similar to our medieval story. So what happens is that they send to the patriarch after they've done that, they dig up the body and bring it into the church so that it can't bother people anymore. They're there, they're saying prayers over it, they're giving services, and suddenly it dissolves. And it turns out that was the exact moment of excommunication. Who would have thunk it? So um, Paul, is he tells this story, he relates it as a, an interesting tale of other customs, but he is engaging with it as a possibility. He also says that he went to a grave opening himself, but didn't notice anything other than just, you know, an eight day old corpse, really. So although he's engaging with it, there's this sense of a, of a disbelief um, and of this kind of folkloric interest, this traveler's eye, arguably this colonizer's eye going out and seeing the customs of others and assessing them through this sense of your own rationalism. Um, another such account is not the next chronologically, but it's interesting again as another travel account of these, um, of these customs. And it's from The Travels of Three English Gentlemen from 1734. It wasn't published though until 1745 in the Harley and Miscellany volume four, which you can find online. Um, because I know that other scholars have claimed it's 1810, but it wasn't, I don't think. Um, anyway, just some thoughts. Um, 
they are traveling through Carniola, which is in modern day Slovenia, but they also connect the tradition to a number of other countries, including Poland, Serbia, Hungary, Moravia, Lithuania, Russia, maybe the Greeks and Austria. Um, so I have popped a handy dandy European map on there so that you can uh, sort of get a sense of where this um, legend was purported to be coming from. Obviously, you're looking at sort of like Eastern Europe and moving into the Baltic states there. Now, again, it's repeated as a tale from other where. There's this sense always of it. It's widely believed. It's reported always through that framework. Um, and you have at the bottom there, what is widely believed? Well, that dead bodies actuated by infernal spirits sometimes enter people's houses in the night. They fall upon men, women, and children and attempt to suffocate them. And that of such diabolical facts, his countrymen have several very authentic relations. So it's being presented as a custom from otherwhere, but it's also being presented again, perhaps as a possibility. There's lots of eyewitness testimony about it. What you might be noticing um, is there's a dearth of in most of these accounts is any kind of concept of blood drinking. There's a lot of suffocation, there's a lot of removal of life spirits, but there's not a lot of blood drinking yet. So some salient points of these stories, powered by evil spirits, leave their graves at night, they suck blood, but primarily they, they function by suffocating people, there's no corruption in the grave, and he introduces this idea that you can kill them with a steak. Hello Peter. So, on to the famous one. Um, this is the one that most people are very familiar with, I presume. So I don't know if I need to go into that much detail about it. But the Arnold Paul case took Europe by storm and even took England by storm as, as a sort of spectacular event um, or a spectacular narrative that hit the papers and got widely discussed. Um, so it appeared in the London Magazine in 1732. And let's introduce you to the story, just in case you don't know it. I'm going to introduce you to today's vampiric bachelor. He probably wasn't a bachelor, but he is now. Um, so his name was Arnold Paul. His nationality was Serbian. His profession was a hajduk, so he was a, a peasant infantry soldier in the Serbian army, I believe. Some army, Austrian? Mm, I don't know. I have no idea. He was on a border fighting somebody. <laughs> uh, as you can tell, my area of expertise is not uh, politics in that area of uh, Europe at the time. So do feel free to tell me who he was fighting for at the end. Um, there's also worth noting here, something that I'm not going to be talking about and investigating much, but there's obvious links here and discussions of this overlap between Tales of the Vampire and Borderlands, Border Wars, Imperialism, just as an aside. So how did he become a vampire? Well, he was bitten by a Turk. Um, he ate grave soil and he smeared himself in Turk's blood in order to try and get rid of the vampire. And he managed to stop that vampire per persecuting him, but he didn't manage to take away the vampiric curse from himself. So when he died, he became a vampire. And what did he like doing as a vampire? Well, he liked preying on villages in their sleep. He liked feasting on their blood. He liked suffocating people and he liked spreading disease. So the reason that this story became in part so very kind of famous and such a big deal was because it was part of a vampiric plague, which was addressed by the local military, local authorities, med medical doctors. And you have um, a number of written reports deliberately um, commissioned as well, for example. And you have these sort of, you have these testimonies of educated men who are providing evidence or discussion of this. Um, and they were cases which were widely propagated, um, not just by the, the monarchs who were um, directly involved in those countries, but across a particular area of Europe. Um, and what happened, so part of the, of the discovery, um, part of this story is that the, un, uh, the opening of the coffin is, is reported. So, and what happened? Well, he had blood flowing from his eyes, nose, and mouth. His nails and his skin had regrown on his hands. And he had a red body and he had lustrous hair and beard. There was lots of it. <laughs> um, so what did they do? Well, they staked him through the heart, which he didn't like very much. Um, they decapitated him and they burnt him into a crispy pile of ash. 
So as I said, this story was one which arrived in England and was discussed. Um, and it was also one which was widely discussed in Europe as a possibility in a certain period in Europe. In that, it also echoed that 1718 case that I've noted at the bottom there. I'm not even gonna try and pronounce it because I will get it wrong. Sorry, I've got itchy nose. Um, both of these were engaged in that same kind of discourse. And what you have is this vampire craze in Europe in the, the early years of the 1700s, where you have this idea of a vampire investigation. There's the investigation of specific events, an empirical approach. Um, there's a reliance on expert testimony and witness, which is being called upon and offered during these vampiric plagues. And then you also have a much wider philosophical debate. And Nick Groom points to um, a wide amount of sources. I don't know if he's caught them all. I have not found them all myself. Um, 12 books, four dissertations on vampirism, and over 22 treatises published in the three years that followed. So you certainly have this massive explosion of interest and discussion in the vampire. They didn't really make it to England. England wasn't a part of those discussions particularly. Um, I've also put to one side there one of the most famous works that discusses vampires in the 18th century, which some of you may or may not have read, um, which is uh, Cal May's dissertation on apparition, apparition spirits, vampires and revenants in Hungary, Moravia, etc. Um, and this was written slightly later, so this was already in the 1740s. And what's quite interesting to note is that Calme um, uses this text to discuss a lot of different spiritual apparitions, but the one of one of the ones that he's most negative about is the vampire. Um, he has a number of sort of objections and quibbles to put forward. Some part of that is his recognition of the fact that it's broadly anti-Catholic. It's a piece of Greek Orthodox propaganda in, in some of the cases that he mentions. Um, and also he has a number of theological qualms and questions about the ability of the um, dead to be raised by demons. But what's going on in England? Do you have this kind of discussion as you do with the ghost? Do you have this kind of fantastic engagement with the vampire? Is it real? Is it not? Not so much. Not really. Because you don't have this ingrained... Uh, tradition or folk tradition which you're uncovering and discussing and you don't have lots of different homegrown examples to then investigate um, as you did with the ghost as we discussed last week. Uh, Butler I think overstates it here but suggests that the phlegmatic English uh, had reacted with lofty scorn from day one and after the rash of vampire treaties in the 1730s and 40s the monster ceased to provide an object of serious contemplation. But certainly by the end of the century, you don't really have it being um, discussed as a possibility that much, um, hardly at all. Um, the, the investigations and discussions that went on in the 1730s and 40s all largely concluded it wasn't real. There was a lot of different medicalized explanations, for example, of how these plagues had happened, including kind of um, an appeal to poor diet, etc. And you do get this idea of the vampire as spectacle in the way that we discussed last week. So this idea of the vampire is existing within the fictional world, which you're creating in a Gothic text, but not something that you're being asked to engage with and engage with its reality and engaging with its sort of theologies, for example, or the beliefs endemic in it. You're being asked to engage with it as a symbolic carrier of meaning, but not as potentially real. So you do get this very quick shift in, um, in England to the idea of the vampire as metaphor, and particularly as political metaphor. So in the very same year as the um, Arnold Poor case was reported in the London magazine, you have uh, Darnett, I think it is. Um, he's, there's a very long article on it, but he's discussing vampires. He suggests that these Arnold Poor cases are allegory themselves, um, connecting it to kind of imperial, um, discourses or anti-imperial discourses. These vampires are said to torment and kill the living by sucking out all their blood. A ravenous minister in this part of the world is compared to a leech or a bloodsucker and carries his oppressions beyond the grave by anticipating the public revenue issues and entailing perpetuity of taxes, which sounds horrendous, which must gradually drain the body politic of its blood and spirits. So this sense of the vampire keeps then getting used in political allegories. It's also used to allegorize other things. You'll see it used 
in discussions about business and uh, sort of capitalist businessmen and also of course as uh, relatively frequently as an anti-semitic trope trope particularly in discussions of money lenders um, you also find in one of my favorite super random examples um, that it's become metaphor just for greed as well in different ways so um, in John Cleland's The Memories of Memoirs of a Coxcomb, I don't know if any of you will have read it. Um, do I recommend it? No, it's it's a it's a wild ride, um, but it's not necessarily particularly a pleasant one. Um, anyway, John Cleland uses this example of the vampire, or this idea of the vampire. So he's talking about a lady; her lover is hiding in the house and watching what she's doing, and wait. She's got a breastfeeding lady in the house and her servant, who she never talks about. <gasps> What's going on? Um, What's going on is this. She could not, however, prevail over the nurse to conquer her fears and aversions so far as to suckle this babe of delight, a grown man. But by dint of increasing her hire and then with her face averted, she gave him her breast, which she fastened upon and looked more like a sucking demon or a vampire escaped from his grave than a human creature presented in short a horrible caricature of the story of Roman piety where a daughter saves the life of her condemned father by the nourishment of her breast. So if you don't know, John Cl Cleland writes erotica, um, but well, yeah. Um, <laughs> so there you go. Already the vampire is um, becoming sort of, becoming metaphor, becoming allegory, um, becoming a symbolic carrier, but not uh, really being engaged with as, uh, as a reality. So that brings me to the end of the prehistory of the vampire. So time for some questions with this amazing gif. Um, and whatever I wrote at the top there, in the touch of this bosom, there worketh a spell that is Lord of thy utterance. So break the spell and ask a question. I had fun with my gifts today, guys, just so you know. Um, yeah, do you have any questions, quotes, problems that you would like to point out with me? And my work. I'm slightly hiding from Kaya, I think. <laughs> Why do you think the real vampire didn't take hold? I think because there wasn't that sort of long existing tradition um, that continued. I think it was introduced as this kind of folkloric story from other places, places which were considered to be more primitive, um, both for like religious reasons and just generally, because England was like that. Um, I think it was taken in much the same way as you get this kind of interaction with Islamic theology and mythology, that it was interrogated as something other so you, I mean, you know, it was a five days wonder in terms of discussion in England, but it just didn't really catch on. Yes, they were um, engaged in abjection. Sorry, any thoughts about how incorrupt corpses are associated both with saints and vampires? Yeah, I mean, part of like the discussion of the period. So obviously, like in the Catholic Church, there's this um, conception of the incorruptible bodies of the saints. Um, and there's certainly like a discussion in the contemporary literature and in current scholarship about the ways in which this Greek Orthodox uh, depiction of the incorruptible body as demonically possessed is also another hit out at Catholicism, which I think is an interesting um, kind of connection there to the theology of it. That's, that's about as far as my thinking has gone in that it, it it's like a turning on its head of those Catholic claims, but I'd be willing to kind of be schooled on that if other people are more sort of familiar with Greek Orthodox theology, because I'm not, you know, I'm not massively familiar with Greek Orthodox theology. Um, a little tangentially um, more familiar with Russian Orthodox, a lot of crossover, very similar, um, but I'm not good enough at it, I don't think. Um, early vampires seem concerned with objection and the breaking of boundaries and membra membranes and uncleanness. I think basically for me, the, the vampire is essentially unclean. It's, um, theologically speaking, it's the walk, it's walking corruption. So it's, it's the walking manifestation of the victory of the flesh in theological terms. 
Um, and I think that like, you get that really quite directly put in um, those old accounts. You know, you have this sense of there's, it's the victory of evil in the body. Um, and that's all that's left. Uh, it's not your wheelhouse either. Just interested in how similar the relationship between the creation of the metaphorical vampire and the metaphorical werewolf in the 17th and 18th century. Yeah, it's not, I mean, I am less aware of the werewolf. I know some of the crossover, particularly in France, is it? Where there's kind of like a, um, and, and obviously like sort of the, does Cal May talk about werewolves? I can't even remember. Um, yeah. More, generally, you, you get that weird thing where, mainland Europe seems to have werewolf cases mm. and the UK treats them as these oddities and interesting and let's read some fun pamphlets about them mm. um, but I in a similar way that you're talking about this lack of historical stories about vampires there's not a huge history we have black dogs mm. but we don't have a history of that um, and interestingly I think it's associated with the fact that we killed all our wolves very very quickly in this country Mm. Uh, whereas they tended to, I mean, even up into the 17th, uh, into the 1700s, you have like the La Bête de Jovedin in southern France. But it's it's quite similar how the models work, how they go from yeah. interest to spectacle and then metaphor. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I, as I say, I, I'm trying to think of like um, English werewolfy cases but definitely not. I think that's a really interesting explanation I mean from a from a theological standpoint with the vampire I think it's it's not the same thing because it's not about the physical eradication of the wolf but the with the reformation you're getting rid of the theological grounds which let the vampire make any sense so in that sense there's perhaps an eradication in the same way of the possibility of belief but I'm not sure um a ver, a ver. How does the European emergence differ? Um, it depends on what country you're talking about in Europe, really. Um, but uh, you've got it as a sort of ingrained belief in various different uh, European countries, including very obviously Greece, um, but also quite a number of Eastern European countries, although the borders of those countries are very different than they are today. Um, and you have this kind of folk belief that's very clear. But then you've also got, because of the uh, because of the historical shifts and who was in charge and ruling and the different empire things that were going on in that area, um, you have this engagement with the folklore of those countries from outside sources, is how I've understood it. And so you have this engagement then of the sort of the new um, ruling ideology with an existing folkloric tradition and this attempt to engage um, but ultimately reject it, is how I've seen it. And Wales is a tradition of vampiric furniture, amazing. Um, <laughs> bite, bite those who sit or lie in them, like the gnawing of a dog. I did actually see, when I was researching, I saw some more interesting stuff in Wales about vampires than I was seeing in England, but I just didn't have the time to, to go into it properly. But I, like every time someone mentions Wales, I'm like, I really need to go and do more Wales research because it seems like it's really interesting. Um, leprosy is the way that medieval texts discuss the living dead. Does, uh, a ver, I've just lost it. Oh no. Um, me, 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 nope. um, does that fit with your idea of the early Gothic vampire? And would you be able to talk about the theological aspect of it? Um, I'm going to have to think about this because I think it's living dead in a slightly different way, but I, there's a really interesting crossover there. Yeah. I wouldn't say that it does inform the early Gothic vampire, particularly because the early Gothic vampire is very clearly engaging with um, uh, those, those stories that are coming from overseas. And so within terms of that medieval tradition, you can see a, a continuance of certain aspects that are being engaged with theologically or in terms of tropes. Um, but there would definitely be things that were lost. Like I, I, I don't know of any emphasis on kind of a leprosy narrative um, within the early British Gothic or within discussions in the 18th century. Um, so I wouldn't say so, but I think like there, yeah, there's definitely a really interest. I'm going to have to think about that and get back to you, but that's, Oh, where's my pen? Um, it's a really interesting lens through which to look at it because of that 
sort of conception of the death in life of the leprosy, the, the leprosy sufferer. Oh, can somebody tweet that to me? <laughs> leprosy, leprosy, Holly. Just talk about leprosy to yourself. Um, so thank you for that question. Sorry, I can't answer it now. I'll have a think about it and get back with a better answer. Scotland has the wolver, but he's a nice werewolf. Um, I don't know about the wolver either. Sounds exciting though. Um, I was reading Nina Auerbach's Our Vampires Ourselves, and she points out that the full moon went from being a symbol of vampires to being associated with werewolves. That's interesting. I've not really noticed loads of symbology with the moon and vampires. Um, literally, I don't think any of the accounts that I read mentioned it as being a trigger of vampirism. I'm trying to think like all of the medieval ones that I've been reading over the last couple of days, but I could be wrong, but I don't remember it being connected, but I'd be interested in going back over the knee now back and sort of engaging with that because I'm not quite sure where it's from. I'm, it's not clicking in my mind. I think um, it might be more recent, like Dracula, bleeds through the um, um blah, 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 into renfield's room essentially mm. like the moon and he goes on about the full moon i think that sort of comes a bit later quite early on the full moon doesn't really seem to have a huge effect on anything i mean even with the werewolf like full moon really being connected to it doesn't really massively happen until the 19th and then cemented in the early 20th century especially in film mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Like, cause I guess like we get so used to what we have now. It just seems like that must have been, that must be the tradition forever. But yeah, I can't think of it. I think that's something that interests me with the vampire is how like you get all of these different ways of killing and, and you, can, you can trace back to, oh, stakes suddenly appeared, you know? Like it's quite a fun trace back. Um, I definitely want to know about the wolver, the only socialist werewolf. What's going on here? <laughs> um, I don't know about the wolver to, to discuss that with you, Karen um, Adangatang, about the, the symbolic of how the English destroy Scottish culture, but it sounds probable. <laughs> it sounds very, uh, like a very good explanation. I really hadn't expected these early depictions of vampirism to be so explicit, and I'm finding it hilarious. <laughs> Read the connection with wolves. I think I remember Stoker's description of Dracula having some weird overlap between the two, but could be wrong. Uh, I mean, Dracula has control of the werewolves. Is that... Is that one of the first sort of instances of that? Do you want me to be a big, a big nerd? Yeah, go for it, please. There are so many overlaps. Um, firstly, he sort of turns into that big dog when he comes into Whitby, which potentially could also be a wolf. He connects with Berserker the wolf in the London Zoo, and then the Berserker ex like escapes. Um, and then he also, like, Little Red Riding Hood is comes up a few times. Um, in relation to Lucy, once she's the blue fur lady, and his hands, the the hands of Dracula, are very, and his monobrow is very like a description of what werewolves are like from Sabine Baring Gould, um, mm. and his fangs are in fact very similar to a description of Jean Grenier, um, who was a werewolf boy in France. Mm -hmm. And Baring Gould writes about it, and Drac uh, sorry, Stoker definitely reads Baring Gould, and we see in his notes that he's made like little like comments, like oh, like this, like this, like this. And right at the beginning, when he, he's warned about Dracula, um, someone says, uh, you know, Harker writes down, "There's this myth of the Vrokolaka, I've pronounced it terribly, which means either vampire or werewolf. Mm. Yeah. Thinking about it, like in the Russian tradition, it's very unclear what's what most of the time when it's being being discussed. Um, so I'm just looking as well at Mason and the moon. Yes, you're all right. I had totally forgotten about Ruthven and um, the moon and putting him under the moon. But I honestly can't think of another example. And maybe I'm just blanking because I'm garbage. But blood is definitely predating the moon in terms of the folkloric background um and in the stories that i'm going to be chatting about today blood predates the moon i don't know i don't i can't remember you know back at all basically um 
there's this, I don't know if she's doing this or not. So there's a certain trend within scholarship from a certain period to look at Polidori as the starting point of the vampire in literature. Does she do that? I can't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing, if that's a, an engagement with it. But um, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know. I have to go back and think about it. I'm not really sure because as I say, there's not, there's not really that many examples. There's the Varkal there's the Vrdalak in Russia. She looks briefly at folklore. Yeah. I don't know. Something like um although I have my problems with Nick Groom, he does quite a good job of looking at um the context of the 18th century, even though I disagree with his um definition. But I'm just trying to think of all the different vampire stories that I'm going to be talking about today and which ones include the moon as a, as a, an actuator. Um, I'll have to go back and, and read them actually looking for the moon. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. She's looking at modern ones. Okay. I will think about it and get back to you. <laughs> um, yeah. Interesting, but hmm. anywho, I will. Uh, does anyone have any other questions about that little bit of prehistory of the vampire, or shall I get going with the second bit? Theology time. <laughs> you know, your soup's excited about theology time. Um, <laughs> a ver, so lovely lady vampire gif. Um, so, this question. Of our vampires, pure spectacle. Are they just for the fun in um, that period? And my answer, but of course, is no. Um, so this is from, I'm quoting myself because I was too lazy to put this in better words. So the vampire entered the British consciousness as an already largely debunked foreign curiosity, but we cannot separate the vampire entire, entirely from previous. Um, revenants without ignoring the ideological and specifically theological framework within which these creatures were understood. So much like with the ghost, although they're appearing within a fictional world as only existing within that fictional world, they are underpinned by certain frameworks of understanding, um, which some of which we've already started to sort of like work out a little bit. Um, as uh, Agnes Magotti said quite a long time ago, vampiric laws always tend to throw light on ideas about the body and soul and about the relationship of body and soul after death, reflecting definitely in the English tradition, a, a very specific Christian conception of the um, connection between body and soul. Uh, Victor Sage, who I don't know if any of you know him, he uh, wrote on theology and the Gothic back, back in the day. Um, uh, suggest that the vampire myth is never neutrally inherited, always an element in the contemporary politics of belief. You can't disassociate it entirely from what it is possible to understand about the issues with which the vampire engages, if that makes sense. So the vampire is inevitably engaged with a number of different topics that I've put here. Um, like the other immortal immortals of the early British Gothic, immortal immortals, the vampiric figure is never wholly extricable from theologies of resurrection. Theologies of the body and soul, discussions of tolerance and damnation. Um, that last bit comes about because of this connection with religious othering that you get in the vampire. So what I'm wanting to do and study with the vampire is often we sort of look at the vampire apart. Um, we've had a really interesting discussion about trying to look at the vampires alongside werewolves, which I've not done, which would be a better thing, to, a, a good thing to do. Um, but what I'm wanting to do is <laughs> within the sort of context of the British Gothic is put the vampire into the context of other immortal wanderers and the theological frameworks, these broad theological frameworks, which are um, really lying at the root of all of these depictions of immortal wanderers in the early British Gothic. So um, before I do that, I want to point out the ways in which all of these discourses, both these medieval and Renaissance discourses and these inherited discourses from Cilicia and Greece are all um, 
really sort of underpinned by different theologies. So you have um, exorcism, wrong, <laughs> excommunication. I'll change that for putting the slides up. Uh, so vampirism is a result of excommunication. And I, I mentioned before that you get this as a recurring motif and sort of a central part of the understanding of what the vampire is during the period, because you have this um, 1823 article on vampirism, where it goes back to this idea that we apprehend as the real source of the vampire superstition. And although this is, of course, just one man or woman or person um, saying this, you certainly have this idea of the continuance of the importance of that narrative for how the vampire was understood and how the vampire could be used and portrayed. So there's this continual connection with religious othering, with damnation. Uh, this idea, of course, is vampirism as a punishment is uh, sort of universal within those early sources. We, and, you know, we have to disconnect it in some ways from the ways that we see vampirism now. It's not just about Edward Cullen torturing about, wibbling about how sad his life is. These are discourses in which definitely I would say all of the vampire stories pretty much within that early period very heavily lean into this conception as vampirism as a damnation, a condemnation and a curse. Um, vampirism is the offspring of religious othering, I've already discussed. And vampirism, this is the main theological point here, as a form of embodied damnation. Um, so what is the theology of this embodied damnation? I'm going to try and take you through it slowly. And if you're a theologian, you'll understand that this is quite like a basic entry point to the theology of this. So excuse that. I'm very happy to take questions. Um, so first of all, what is the underlying theological framework? Point number one, the idea of inherent duality, as we see here in Galatians. The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And they are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Um, I, I use a 1700 version of the Bible because why not? It sounds cooler. Um, basically, this idea that humans are always composed of both flesh and spirit not like stuck together with super glue or anything, but that we are inherently dualistic or we have inherently dual natures. Um, a, a very common and deeply irritating mistake um, in, in literary theory is this conception of the flesh and the spirit as being the body and the soul. They're not synonymous terms. The spirit and the soul are roughly speaking synonymous. The spirit is the idea of the part of you that is eternal immortal, connected to the divine, connected to his essence, and is capable of being uh, pure and saved and washed clean. The flesh is the old self, the corrupted self, the sinful self that you've put up. And it's often connected to the body, but it's not synonymous with it. It's not the idea that everything about the body is bad, but it is the idea that there's an inherent sort of corruption going on. Because, as we're told in Romans 6.23, because Adam ate that apple, the way everybody is condemned to die and the wages of sin is death. We're all inherently dep depraved, total depravity. Um, we're all inherently corrupt and we've inherited death in our bodies, in our corrupt bodies from um, Adam. And that's not to say all of our body is corrupt, but it's like, imagine you've popped an ink blot on me. It's that sort of staining, which is ineradicable from the body, but eradicable from the soul. Very, very loosely. Um, the third point, the body cannot live forever, but the spirit can. So we're told that if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but spirit is life because of righteousness. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. So there's this differentiation. The body has to die but the spirit will live. Um, and that that thou sowest is not quickened except it die. You have to die bodily. You have to undergo the natural death to avoid, um, to, get it, to get the possibility of a spiritual life. Um, and there's also a sense, this is much more dependent on the different theologies of various denominations, churches and individuals. But um, you have this idea of the resurrection body so that you um, will be raised into a new physical body, potentially, and the corruptible must put on incorruption and the mortal shall have immortality. Just as an aside here, um, don't get your hopes up too high. 
So even if you're resurrected as you will be, you might be resurrected into the resurrection of the unjust and then dumped in the fire. So don't get your hopes up. Um, there's definitely a sense in which immortal wanderers, there's this weird tension because their, in, their continued embodied immortality keeps them from that natural death, which can lead to spiritual life. But also the fact that they're still bodily alive allows for that possibility eventually of spiritual life. Um, but also the potential of an eternal spiritual death as well, sad times. So um, this idea of embodied damnation informed by this kind of concept of the flesh and the spirit and the dual soul um, is found in a number of different kind of embodied damnation archetypes that we have, which inform a lot of these different portrayals in the Gothic and in literature, which I'm going to come on to in a second. People like Faust and Melmoth um, and Winsy. We're going to talk about Winsy. You'll get to meet him and St. Leon. Uh, I hope you appreciate my background picture there. It's Adam and Eve chilling with some dinosaurs. Uh, biblical. And <laughs> sorry, I'm just, I've got my slides on sheets here so that I can see ahead of time where I'm going. Um, so the first one is Adam. And you might be thinking, what are you talking about, Sam? No, Adam brought death into the world, not life. But he offers um, a sort of archetype of how things go wrong, how embodied damnation can occur. So he's eating from the tree of life as he's a part of the Garden of Eden. They're immortal when they're in the Garden of Eden. But then he dares to eat from the tree of knowledge. And that combination of immortality and knowledge would lead to him becoming like one of us, says God becoming a deity basically and so he's cursed with banishment from the garden of eden and from life and death enters the world but you have this idea with a lot of these um wanderers that they are essentially a perverted second adam so within christian theology the second adam is usually considered to be christ if adam brought death into the world christ brought life into the world it's the counterpart of adam um, but the perverted second Adam is the one who takes from the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and survives it um, and enters, therefore, a sort of endless death and an, an unending and impossible to end death. Um, there's my gift for you. Um, and you'll see lots of second Adams in Faustian figures and people like Melmoth the Wanderer. Another um, classic archetype of ye embodied damnation, immortal wanderer is Cain. And you'll find quite a lot of vampire stories, particularly nowadays, that, that lean into this and make Cain a vampire. There's also uh, lots of different anti-Semitic uses of both the Cain figure and the vampire, which come together in some of the vampire lore in the 19th century, particularly. Cain, if you don't know, killed his brother. Um, and then he was cursed to wander, basically, um, as a punishment of vagabond upon the earth. But he goes, no, people will kill me. That sucks. Don't do that to me, God. And God's like, okay, I'll make sure no one can ever kill you. Have the mark of Cain. It'll make people hate you, but also not kill you. So he's condemned to this life of eternal wandering and estrangement from mankind, estrangement from life. Second immortal one. But the, the, his life, therefore, is imagined as a punishment, not as a reward. Um, then you also have the wandering Jew who I've talked about before. I'm willing to go into that again. Um, it's a very old myth, but comes to prominence in Europe in the 16th century, where it becomes tied to um, a Jewish figure rather than a more nebulous Roman slash Jewish figure. It's a person who refused to help Jesus on the road to Golgotha, and then they're cursed to wander eternally acting as a witness. Um, they're repentant, but they are forever unforgiven. Again, this very clear concept of embodiment as a form of damnation. Um, the last of the archetypes is the tortured Rosicrucian. And by Rosicrucian, I am using the way that Mary Mulvey Roberts uses it. So the Rosicrucian is somebody who has discovered immortality as an alchemist through discovering the elixir vitae. Um, and they, ap they appear usually as a form of second Adam, doubly condemned by their access to both life and knowledge. Um, and you'll also find in these novels that everything tends to go wrong <laughs> and it ends up being that they're trapped in an immortality, which is a burden. So if those are some of the archetypes of eternal wanderers, do they apply to the vampire? Well, yes, the vampire is informed by a number of different um, 
archetypes of embodied damned wanderers. Um, this is the, uh, from the Paul Rico book that I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the, the 1679 source. And he quotes the curse of excommunication as he understood it. So you've got the Greek and the English there. Um, and he mentions a number of biblical figures, not all the same ones, but this connection to different um, theologically condemned figures. So uh, Gehazi uh, tried to take uh, money for somebody else's healing of leprosy and inherited leprosy as a result. So there's an interesting link for the person there who was talking about the, the crossover between leprosy as a living death and the vampire. It's quite clearly imagined in this Greek source. Um, it's an eternal curse and it's inherited. Uh, you've got obviously the link to Judas, which people keep telling me is what happens in Dracula 2000. Spoiler alert, because I've been spoiled. Um, linked to the betrayer, given over to the devil. So in the biblical narrative, Jesus was handed over into the power of the devil before he betrayed Jesus. Dathan and Abiram were both rebels and malcontents in the, uh, when Moses fled from Egypt and they were swallowed up by the earth. Classic uh, proportionate response there and obviously Cain and Cain's curse. So you have this idea of these biblical archetypes drawing from a number of different um, ideas and sources, theological and otherwise, that I've talked about just now, um, appearing as the root of the vampire and how that curse is understood. So let me introduce you to a couple of the mortal immortals. So as I say, I'm wanting to put the vampire within that larger context in, in the early Gothic period of mortal immortals and this exploration of embodied damnation. Um, I do have a lot more work that I've done on these books. So if you have questions, feel free to ask. This is just a whistle stop tour through this idea. Uh, Mary Shelley's The Mortal Immortal, 1833. If any of you keen-eyed people have been noticing that my thesis ended 1764 to 1833, this is why. So I could talk about this story. Um, in it, Winsy is one of the failed Rosicrucians. He accidentally drinks <laughs> the, the elixir of life, stealing it from his master um, because he thinks it will cure him of love. And it does in a way. It makes him immortal. And he um, eventually grows tired of his life because he loses everyone. It's very sort of Highlander, if you're a fan of the first Highlander film, um, except his wife is kind of awful but he imagines his immortal body as a tenacious cage for a soul which thirsts for freedom and his plan eventually if he if he lives through what he intends to do in exploring the arctic is to destroy himself atom by atom um in saint leon by william godwin you have another failed rosicrucian um this is an actually saint leon talking this is the man nicola zampieri i think who gave him the elixir. And this is before St. Leon accepts it. And he's like, yeah, it sounds great. After the guy has been like, I'm hated by mankind, hunted from the face of the earth, pursued by every atrocious calumny, without a country, without a roof, without a friend. The addition that can be made to such misfortunes scarcely deserves a thought. And St. Leon's like, yeah, it sounds good. I want some of that. And obviously it all goes wrong. And his um, immortality is imagined as a form of kind of continual repetition uh, of a lack of growth and a continual sort of entrapment. Uh, tortured immortals, less annoying, uh, maybe a little bit darker to some extent. Uh, Melmoth the Wonder, who we've talked about a lot, he's not immortal per se, but he engages with a Faustian pact and gets 150 years of, uh, of wandering. But what's quite interesting about the story is that his damnation doesn't begin at the end of those 150 years. It begins at the start of them as he is damned from that moment and forced into this life, which is essentially fruitless, pointless and torturing and tormenting where he's separated from uh, all of his fellow men, from all human emotion, from all joy, from all love, from all possibility. Um, and in Matthew Lewis, you have a stranger who is often uh, discussed as the wandering Jew, but is actually referenced as a number of different archetypal figures, including Faust, for example. He gets to have magical powers, um, but he's also extremely terribly cursed. He's unable to stay in one place. He inevitably inspires hatred and he bears the mark of Cain. So the stranger is definitely Cain, but is he the wandering Jew as well? Who knows? But once again, you have this idea of an embodied immortality. And what you see in this one, as you'll quite often get to see in Wandering Jew portrayals in the work of Percy Shelley, for example, is this use of immortality to condemn or defy the divine. We'll see a little bit of that um, in the second part about sexuality. 
just in one story though. So, um, is this true with vampires? Yes, quote from myself again, um, basically just reiterating, these early Gothic vampires are geographically and theologically distant from the contemporary English reader. So I'm going to talk about two examples in a second, Talaba the Destroyer by Robert Southey and the Geo by Byron, and both of them are geographically and theologically distant, set in a Muslim uh, landscape. Um, in faraway countries. The texts don't engage with the fantastic consideration of the possibility of these figures. Fantastic, as we discussed last week, a hesitation between is it real, is it not? Um, and rather they act as symbolic carriers of ingrained theological meanings of religious othering and body, soul and flesh spirit division. So you've got this um, underlying narrative of embodied damnation um, and you've also got this in underlying narrative of religious othering going on. So this is Byron's The Geo, and it's a lot, much longer poem than this, but part of the poem includes a Muslim fisherman cursing the Geo um, for the crimes that he's committed to become a vampire after death. Um, now, although um, Byron is writing this within a predominantly Muslim setting, he, in his footnotes, he refers to the myths of Greece, for example. So he's in Hungary, I think, is the other country he mentioned. So he's definitely taking these European conceptions and very directly engaging with that folkloric material. Um, and so he talks obviously about this vampire on earth and um, this man on earth is vampire sent, thy course shall from its tomb be rent. So the sense of the unnatural prolongation of life as punishment, as a vampire sent by somebody, by God, presumably. You also have this emphasis on um, what I have termed an infectious destruction. So there's not an emphasis here on blood drinking and this um, infection of vampirism, but there is a sense of something that Christopher Herbert calls a heretical infection. Um, which is basically what's happening is this in destruction is infectious. It's destroying him and then he passes it on to his family and it kind of flips over um, a biblical promise that you shall save yourself and save your house. It's you shall damn yourself and damn your house. Um, and he's, you know, he's going to have to drink the blood of all thy race there from thy daughter, sister, wife at midnight dream the stream of life. Um, and obviously this idea of the vampire's lack of will within this situation as well. Again, really underlining that conception of a, um, a divine injunction, a divine punishment. This is from Talaba the Destroyer by Robert Southey um, from 1801. It's a much, much longer narrative poem about a Muslim hero who's he's basically a Protestant in disguise in terms of how he speaks, what he says, how he paraphrases the Bible all the time. Um, but he is on a quest, quest, a quest to destroy sorcerers and magicians and demons. Um, but he meets Anaza, who is a lovely young lady, falls in love as you do, wanders off for a while, comes back and she's dead. Um, goes to her grave at night. And in that hideous light, Anaza stood before him. It was she. Her very lineaments as such as death had changed them, livid cheeks and lips of blue. But in her eyes there dwelt brightness more terrible than all the loathsomeness of death. Still out there living, wretch. Told you. In all her time, she cried to Thalaba, And must I nightly leave my grave to tell thee still in vain God has abandoned thee? This is not she, the old man exclaimed. A fiend, a manifest fiend. And to the youth he held his land. Strike and deliver thyself. Um, the, the old man is her father, by the way. Just as an interesting point there. I don't think in this example we're getting, as we do in the Geo, a sense of religious othering and its connection to the vampire, because both of the protagonists are Muslim. But um, I think what we do get here is quite a, a key overlapping um, of theology and the vampire. We also get a slightly different understanding of the vampire here as a reanimated by a demon um, soul very specifically with the spirit of Anaza actually there because when she's killed she cries out thank you I'm free basically and then drifts off into the ether presumably but what we do get is the idea that the killing of the vampiric self dislodges the demon and ends the torturous imprisonment of Anaza in the space between natural and spiritual death so after natural death and before spiritual life and the demon of disbelief 
has been defeated, setting both Anasa and Talaba three. So you have this kind of vampiric conception, this vampiric self as disbelief and doubt. Um, and that sort of theological undertone of doubt is damnation that's been holding to lower back. And then after this, he goes back and goes on his quest, defeats the demons, saves the world, you know. So that's the end of the second part. Um, a bit of theology. Don't worry, we're getting on to sexy vampires next. But any questions? Hmm. Um, I think I remember the concept of a, a sort of mirrored Eve and Lilith having some link to vampirism. Would I be right in saying that? Yes, definitely. So if we're talking about the tradition of female vampires, there's often like a really clear connection to the myth of, uh, or to the legend story of Lilith. Um, and this sense, like there's, there's quite often like a very uh, overt discussion of female vampires as the, as the descendants of Lilith, as there is, you know, with vampires in Cain sometimes. Um, Vampires of Judas, even occasionally, um, but yes, you do get that sense of um, this sort of demonic uh, other side of the coin, so the second Adam and the other Eve, the the rebellious, the uncontrollable, the sensual Eve, the monstrous one. Where does the repentant and fighting against their nature vampire begin? I mean, I think you're getting a sense of the tragic vampire already in the 19th century. Um, I've not read all of Varney yet because it's massive, um, but I'm not sure if there's definitely a sense of anti-heroism in Varney as well. Um, and certainly I would say if you look at, um, I'm going to be looking at them in a second, but if you look at Augustus Darvel, which is um, Byron's fragment about a vampire, that is much, he doesn't complete it, so you don't get that, but it's really leaning into that kind of Byronic, tormented soul narrative, rather than the Polidori narrative where he's just like, yeah, I'm living the life, I'm ruining everything, it's great. Um, so I think like in the 19th century, you're really starting to get that. You get it um, more frequently in the female vampire narratives earlier on. So I'm going to talk about in a second the way that you get that sort of appearing in um, Christabel by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And also in arguably in Carmilla as well, you get this sense of that, that tension um, between the vampiric desires and the awareness of the demon's own condemnation if that makes sense and then obviously definitely as you're moving into the 20th century but you i think with the vampire you get this constant like you you get two streams that are always developing two or more you know you you, you continue to have the monstrous vampire up to today as you do the um the forgivable the anti-heroic vampire the reimagined vampire like we were reading i am legend obviously on thursday uh, it's a very different kind of conception of the vampire there's no need to be tortured when you've medicalized the discourse in a sense because it's not a theological uh condemnation anymore or it's not a belief like an ideological condemnation um could you elaborate on the dichotomy of the flesh and body soul and spirit yields um so the reason that i like to sort of differentiate is because this the idea that um the flesh is the body leads to sort of very bad theology of like the body itself is, is evil, inherently evil. So human beings are inherently evil <laughs> in Christian theology, inherently condemned, inherently tainted, inherently sinful. Um, and part of that is to do with the, the, the self that we are now and it is within our flesh, but not all of our flesh is evil. So the desires of our flesh aren't necessarily evil. The desires of our body, sorry, aren't necessarily evil. Um, the wants of our body aren't necessarily evil. The problem with kind of making the flesh and the body the same thing in discussion is that it leads into sort of that, that really bad condemnatory, um, very ruthless sort of horrible anti-sex, anti, a very kind of, a, what's it called? Ascetic uh, sort of uh, view of religion. Um, and I mean, you do obviously get that within um 
within a lot of different religious denominations to some extent um but within the the mainstream christian theology is that differentiation the flesh is used to discuss more broadly the sinful self which also includes kind of some of that internality it includes things like pride um which isn't from a which you know if you're thinking about it in terms of like medieval thought or modern or even how we think of things today we don't think of pride as like coming out of our armpits you know in the same way that we think about lust coming out of our loins um so i think it's that's why i make the distinction the soul and spirit is i i don't have as much of a problem with with considering those to be the same thinking about them as the same thing the soul or the spirit is the part of you that's immortal and the part of you that is a reflection of the divine and a part of you which is essentially incorruptible uh not incorruptible no it's just it's the part of you that has been made new after conversion so it's the part of you that is saved basic oh that's so oh that's so basic it's almost wrong but <laughs> there you go um a ver. i've seen a lot of conspiracy stuff about jesus's vampire rose from the dead linked to blood drinking is there anything official on that no it's terrible theology terrible dad terrible um, i have definitely seen it um, it's, it's like quite a lot of the zombie narratives where it's like, your Lazarus was a zombie, you know? Um, but it's a complete misunderstanding of, uh, the resurrection. Um, and it only will come from an atheological position. So there are two types of resurrection, um, which you're getting within this kind of mythology. There's a resurrection into death and a resurrection into life. That's apart from like the final resurrection of judgment into death and life. But the resurrection of Lazarus, the resurrection of Jesus was into a new resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus certainly was into a renewed resurrection body. Um, and Jesus didn't drink any blood. Uh, people drank his or they drank a symbolic representation of his blood. Um, yeah, I don't, I think that's the official thing is that it's basically just a perversion of theology. Um, and it, and it's, it's fine, but it's vexing to me. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's nice if you explore it. Well, there's a really good, and I wish I could remember the writer. There's a really, really good Russian story, of course. Um, I don't know if Anastasia or oh, Nastya, you, you know, um, about Lazarus from like the end of the 19th century, I think. And it reimagines the Lazarus story, but it specifically addresses it as a reimagining of Lazarus, as like what it would be like if it wasn't a resurrection um, into life, if it was a resurrection into death. You know, there's a very there's a there's a very clear difference in Christian theology between an, a, a continuous living death and an undying life, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, cute cat. <laughs> I wish I had a cat. Um, <laughs> yes, dying and reviving God. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely do really interesting things with that outside, the, outside of that basic theological framework. Um, and I'm all up for that. Um, I am all up for it, really. It's just I read a lot of quite bad theology and literature studies coming from a basic misunderstanding of the underlying principles, which is, it's all right if you're doing a fun reimagining based on your understanding of the principles, you know, but if it's just like, I don't know, you know, it's like, well, Lazarus is actually a zombie. It's like, no, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of the principles of resurrection. Um, but that's just me being a nerd. You have to be though, don't you? I think really, if that's your field, you've got to be passionate about it. Or she just sadly die on the side of a road thinking, oh my God, how bored I am. Um, <laughs> so any other questions about that bit? Or are you all just like, get onto the sexy vampires, please. <laughs> sexy vampires it is. <laughs> I'm going to disappoint you. Um, <laughs> Um, because I'm just, I'm going to put up a couple of content warnings just even before I start. A, um, the way that sexuality is represented in um, the early vampire is very negative. Like what we get later on in the 19th century is obviously more of an exploration of transgressive sexual desire. 
Um, although it's ultimately punished, for example, at the end of Dracula, or well, just in the middle when Lucy gets stabbed to death, um, symbolically. And uh, but then obviously in the 20th, 21st century, you have this move into uh, the use of the vampire because of the liminal space which the vampire dwells in anyway between life and death you have this kind of investigation of the vampire as a liminal figure between other things as well um, and often like vampires are gender fluid like i think it was you mason who recommended a really excellent story with a trans man vampire i don't know if you if it was you and if you remember it but if you if you remember it can you pop it in the chat because that was really good mm, kim sparrows okay i don't I can't remember. I can't remember the link. Does anyone have the link? <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, we're used to a kind of much more uh, sex-friendly vampire. That is not what we're about to go for, I am afraid. Um, and also, content warning, I'm going to be discussing uh, homophobia from the 18th century. Um, that's why I'm wearing my little, little queer pride ghost. <laughs> um, to show that I very much don't agree. Also, it's quite ridiculous. Um, it's, uh, I'm using a text specifically about masturbation. Oh, thank you. Um, the link to the story is there. I recommend it. It's a really good reimagining of the vampire. Um, uh, yes, so let's go for it. I tried to bring some gifts to lighten the mood. Gifts in nice pictures. So, <laughs> sexy vampires. Richard Roxburgh having a wee dance there. I know it's not the most popular, but I like him as Dracula. So, getting into this connection between the vampire and sexuality. Right from the word go, we have this, probably the first literary vampire is Henrik August Ossenfelder's De Vampire from 1748. And I've just put the whole poem up because why not? Um, it's a translation, obviously, from the German, and I cannot attest to its complete accuracy. I don't, I've, I've gone through it word by word with Google Translate before, but I'm not a German speaker, so I can't really help with this one. Um, the middle of the first verse doesn't sound great to me, but... My dear young maiden clingeth, and bending fast and firm to all the long-held teaching of a mother ever true, as if in vampires and mortal folk on the faces portal, hay-like, hay-duck-like do believe. But my Christine, thou dost dally and wilt my loving parry, till I myself avenging to a vampire's health a drinking him toast in pale toque. Type of wine. I didn't know that because I don't drink. Um, and as softly thou art sleeping to thee, I shall come creeping and thy life's blood drain away. And so shalt thou be trembling, for thus shall I be kissing, and death's threshold thou it be crossing with fear in my cold arms. And last shall I be question, compared to such instruction, what are a mother's charms? So a couple of points here. Uh, there's this very evident overlap between sexuality and the vampire. And it's also worth noting that this very obvious, uh, obviously faced theological threat of the vampire as well is combined with this kind of um, connection to sexuality. So he's not only um, killing her, arguably or metaphorically raping her um but he's also um sort of is this opponent to the christian teachings of her mother upon which she has been raised so we often think of the first sort of aristocratic sexy vampire being polidori but it's not true i think within the german tradition we have quite a few and i'm going to share with you another classic story in a second which i had so much fun reading but has the most idiotic hero you've ever seen. Um, so we also have a connection with sexuality. And I said a little bit earlier that there's some of these that pick up on that use of the immortal wanderer as a challenge to God. And this is the one that I was thinking of. It's Goethe's Bride of Corinth. And it details the story of a man who goes to the house of his affianced bride as was, but her family have um, converted to Christianity and, sh and he is pagan. And so they're going to not allow the marriage. We think she's still alive, but she's not. Um, anyway, he doesn't know what's going on. So he's just like laying about, as you can see from the picture, just, you know, living his dream. And um, she comes to the bedroom at night and 
they have some sexy times. And then the mother comes in and is like, what's going on here? Oh my God, no. And then this, I've not, this isn't a full set of verses. I've just picked out bits because it's quite long. But from my grave to wonder, I am forced still to seek the good's long severed link, still to love the bridegroom I have lost and the lifeblood of his heart to drink. When his race is won, I must hasten on and the young must neath my vengeance sink. Mother, to this final prayer give ear. Let a funeral pile be straightway dressed. Open then my cell so sad and drear that the lovers may give, that the flames may give the lovers rest. When ascends the fire from the glowing pyre to the gods of old will hasten blessed. So there's obviously, again, this connection of the vampire and the vampiric curse with sexuality and with um, acting upon sexual desire. Um, and we'll talk about the theology a, a little bit of that later. But you do have, I think, an interesting flipping of the script here to some extent in that it becomes an act of rebellion and defiance against the forced conversion that her mother has enacted upon the family. Um, and so you have this, um, you know, this, this rejection of, that, of these views that have made her a vampire and this sense, you know, burn me and I'll be with him and we'll be together in the pagan heavens. So I think it's an interesting flipping of the script and working with those theological undertones, but rejecting them as well, potentially. Okay, this is the slide I spoke about yes, this morning and I was like, I don't even care anymore. It's 5 a.m. I'm still making slides. Uh, defying God to get some. <laughs> the epic journey. Um, so Johann Ludwig Tieck, Wake Not the Dead from 1800. So the question is, how far would you go to get laid? My answer to this is, nope, I wouldn't go anywhere at all. <laughs> but let's, have, let's have some options, shall we? Option number one, would you raise the dead? Option number two, would you leave your currently living wife in order to raise the dead and have sex with your old wife? Would you sacrifice every young person on your land? Would you let your children die? If your answer is yes to any of them, then you're sort of on the same level as the hero of this text, Walter the Idiot, as I have crowned him. I mean, I think the leave your wife one is more of a leave your living wife for your dead wife. Um, also, the question, if you can't see it, is what would you do to protect yourself from said dead wife? Would you think for half a second about your choices? Would you eat a nasty tasting root? Would you stab her in the heart? Would you not marry an obvious demon in disguise for a second time? Well, if you chose <laughs> numbers A, B or C, letters A, B or C, you did more than him. Um, <laughs> he only stabbed her in the heart. That was his like, I'm not doing anything before or after that. This is it. This is my moment. Stab, stab, stab. I'm not like he, well, let me tell you the story. So let me introduce you to our cast of characters, Walter the Idiot, Brynhilda the Malevolent. These are all just titles I've given them just for fun. Swan, Swanhilda, the saintly, disposable children, don't know their names, don't care, various assorted servants, a mystery lady, and a sorcerer. So what happens? Well, Walter married Brunhilde when they were very young and they were passionately in love. But she died. But her memory did not die with her. But he was not inconsolable and he married Swanhilde the saintly, who was lovely, gave him kids and was really nice to him all the time and didn't mind that he was kind of garbage. But he's getting bored with all this like pfft, nice life stuff. And so he's like, I'm going to go weep on the grave of my dead wife some more. And so he does that all the time. And Swanhilda is getting a bit like, oh, this is sad. But she's too saintly to do anything about it. Obvs. Anyway, so he's weeping away on the grave and a sorcerer comes and says, hey, would you want her to be alive again? And the guy's like, yes, more than anything. And the sorcerer goes, that would be really dumb. Uh, don't wake the dead. And the guy goes, but can you wake the dead though? And the sorcerer says, yeah, I guess. And he's like, 
raise the dead for me. And the sorcerer was like, well, I'm going to give you a chance to think about this. I'll come by and meet you tomorrow. And Walter's like, okay. And instead of thinking about it, he literally just walks around the forest all day being like, it's going to get so hot. <laughs> We're going to bang again. Amazing. <laughs> so basically, he comes back and the sorcerer's like, have you thought about it? And Walter's like, yes, of course I've thought about it. I am 100% in. And the sorcerer's like, okay, come back tomorrow. And we'll do it tomorrow if you're still sure. And Walter comes back the next day and he's like, I'm still sure. And he's like, well, this will be a bad idea. And Walter's like, I don't even care. Uh, so it raises Brynhilda the Malevolent from uh, her grave. She's quite pale, doesn't really like the sun anymore, but she's beautiful, even more beautiful than before. And they live for a while in, in sort of the cellar of one of his extra castles. And then, he, and then you know, he's like, can we, you know, can we? And she's like, no, I'm not going to sleep with you while you're married to that other woman. So he goes and gets rid of Swanhilda. Don't worry, doesn't kill her, just sends her to live with her parents. But she doesn't take the kids because she can't, because the law. Um, anyway, Brynhilda moves into the castle and he's just totally enamored. He can't see past it, loving it. But how is she surviving? Well, she's dead, so she has to survive by drinking the blood of people. So she drinks the blood of everybody young in the vicinity. And then she runs out of young people because they're like um, either dead or I'm like, I'm leaving because I don't want to die. So all the servants are leaving. It's like an empty castle, but he's still like, yeah, no, everything's fine. It's cool. And then his children get sick. Oh no. And then his children die again. Oh no. But he doesn't do anything still about this at all. He's like, yeah, it probably wasn't her. Why would it be her? No, definitely not. And then he wakes up in the night and she is chewing on his breast. Um, so he's like, wait a second, are you a monster? And she goes, yes, I am, obviously. Um, because she can't feel anything is basically the whole motto of this story. But I actually really love her comeback to him. Because he's like, my God, you're a murderer. You're abhorrent. Get away from me. And she says, um, I'll just minimize myself for a second so you can see. It is not I who have murdered them. I was obliged to pamper myself with warm, youthful blood in order to satisfy thy furious desires. Thou art the murderer good right so basically a very clear connection there between vampirism and sex but interestingly um sex as the medium through which vampirism is caused um or the desire for sex brings on vampirism in another person um so this sort of the corruption potentially of the female by male lust is what's going on in this story i don't know interesting stuff she goes on though to further defend herself and and him and obviously condemn the sex that has been going on. So um, <laughs> quite a great, he's like, oh no. And she says, why dost thou make mouths at me like a puppet? Hm. Thou who has the courage to love the dead, to take into thy bed, one who had been sleeping in the grave, the bedfellow of the worm, who has clasped in thy lustful arms the corruption of the tomb. Dost thou, unhallowed as thou art, now raise this hideous cry for the sacrifice of a few lives? They are but leaves swept from their branches by a storm. Come chase these idiot fancies and taste the bliss thou hast so dearly purchased. He doesn't. He remains strong. And he eventually manages to get rid of her with the help of the sorcerer, who tells him, you have to stab her in the heart. And he's like, but I don't want to, though. And the sorcerer says, okay, I would if I were you. And so he does. But then he meets, he goes to Swan Hilda the saintly and is like, hey, Swan Hilda, I'm really sorry. I made some mistakes. And she's like, it's okay. I was sad, but not angry. Where are my kids? And he's like, <laughs> and he says, literally, this is actually what happens. He says, oh, they're dead. And she goes, okay, cool. Get out. <laughs> That's it. She never speaks to him again. So just to Swan Hilda. Um, but uh, at the end of the story, what happens is, he meets another woman who looks strangely like Swanhilda and is like, mm, this is great for me. This works out perfectly. Um, and then they get married and they have the sex or they're about to. And then she turns into a giant snake lady and eats him. End of story. So there you go. Um, quite a wild ride. I thought I'd retell it because I didn't think many people would have read it. I don't know if I was wrong in that assumption. 
Uh, definitely a great and interesting story. Um, very clear links between sexuality and the vampire. Um, and also this sense of immortal damnation and the loss of the soul as well, I think is really interesting in this one. The, the, the body is raised, but there's no soul left within it. So there we go with these sort of perhaps less famous iterations of the sexy vampire or the sex dot vampire. Let's get to the one that everybody's been thinking of. Polidori and the Byronic Vampire, or as you know, in my opinion, the anti-Byronic Vampire. Um, so the story that uh, Polidori tells is obviously the story that he wrote after the Via Diodati ghost story telling competition, but it's not the one he started writing. He just took Byron's and then wrote his own. Um, they start off very similarly. There's a young man in the um, Byron one. He's an unnamed narrator who's going on this journey with a man who eventually dies in a graveyard and there's a stork and a snake. Um, I did a reading of it on <laughs> for, the, for the read along this week, if anyone wants to listen to it. Um, but that's all that happens. And then the fragment ends. He has to be buried at a certain time and it's a, a ring has to be thrown into the, the water at a certain day, on a certain time, on a certain day, at a certain time. Um, and then the Polidori version extends the story, but there are some key differences, which I'm going to go over in a minute. But there's a young man named Aubrey who travels with the Lord Ruthven vampiric figure. But instead of this sort of quite nice travel journey, it's, it's, um, he finds out the depths of iniquity in Lord Ruthven, basically. Um, uh, he leaves Lord Ruthven at one point, uh, ends up meeting this Greek nymph who he falls in love with. Um, and then, oh, she's killed by a vampire. And it just so happens that Lord Ruthven turns up the very next day. What a coinky dink. Um, uh, but Lord Ruthven nurses him back to health and then they continue their journeys. Lord Ruthven dies, exacts from Polidori a promise that he won't tell anybody that he died. And um, then when... So not from Polidori, from Aubrey, although Aubrey is very clearly Polidori in this story. Um, and then when Aubrey returns to London, he sees Lord Ruthven again. It drives him in, it drives him mad. He's locked in his room. And at the end of the year, he's like, finally, I'm going to be able to tell people. And then he realizes his sister is marrying Lord Ruthven the very day and she's going to die. Sorry. So um, in both cases, there's an aristocratic male vampire. Um, there's an emphasis in the second one definitely on seduction, um, but the, the characterization is fairly similar on a surface level for both of them. They're both quite clearly Byronic in some sense, but in uh, Byron's tale, Augustus Darvel, he, it's a, a Byronic anti-hero. In Polidori's tale, it's a copy of Byron, the real Byron, much more so, and it's quite condemnatory. So... Um, was he a sycophant or a critic in writing the story? You know my opinion. Um, Gelder suggests that it's usually claimed that Polidori under Byron's influence slavishly plagiarized Byron's fragment, but we could also argue that he uses the material creatively or ironically rather than slavishly. And I think that's very clearly true, that he engages with the material to take Byron down, basically. So let me draw your attention to a couple of the differences between the two narratives, which provide a very different conception of the vampire. Whereas the vampire in Augustus Darvel is arguably um, quite clearly a Byronic anti-hero, a relatively positive conception of the vampire, and much more linked to the creation of a Byronic anti-hero than to the previous folkloric accounts. In The Vampire by Aubrey, although the folklore is quite different than we're used to, he's actually very clearly engaging with those theological and ideological roots of the vampire as this sort of condemned um, embodied immortality. So in The Vampire, Aubrey is virtuous, naive, and steadfast. In Augustus Darvel, the narrator doesn't even have a name because Byron really doesn't care. Um, in the Augustus Darvel, there's no certainty that there's been any deception or condemnation, and there's no condemnation of a character at the point in the story that we're left at, whereas in The Vampire, very quickly, Aubrey is undeceived as to Ruff Ruffin's character and his iniquity. Ruthven's superiority is not only questioned, but destroyed in The Vampire, arguably. He's more knowledgeable, he's more worldly, but he's 100% evil. Um, in Augustus Darvel, Darvel's superiority or difference is actually confirmed. It's very clearly he's Byronic, he's Byroning around, he's like he's remarkable, and nobody can not remark how remarkable he is. 
In the vampire, Ruthven is licentious and abandoned. He loves seducing innocence and he loves um, corrupting people. In Augustus Darvel, Darvel is temperate and controlled. Again, somebody asked about that kind of idea of the tortured vampire, and I think you're seeing the traces of it beginning here, in my opinion. Um, in the vampire, Ruthven is seemingly just emotionless. He just goes through his life being a horror and smirking about it. Whereas in Augustus Darvel, Darvel is clearly, he's, we're told he's under some sort of romantic burden, some tormented historical past mystery. Very Byron. So what's going on in the vampire with this sort of idea of sexuality, but m more generally this idea of um, maybe the underlying motifs of the theology or the um, ideology of the text? Well, we've still got the vampire here as participating in what I've termed before heretical infection. So in the, in the vampire, Ruthven corrupts everyone. His evil is infectious. Um, so there's a couple of examples. He will not bother seducing or sleeping with women of easy virtue, um, but he will seduce the matrons with children and he will seduce the innocent with no history. So he's always corrupting people. Um, there's also examples with he gambles and he won't, he won't, he's happy to lose to a hardened gambler, but if he's playing with like a, a naive young man with a young family, he will take him for everything he's got, quite often leading to suicide, etc. Um, there's also the sense that his charity is a deliberate encouragement to vice of the worst people in society. He never helps the indigent virtuous, we're told, um, which is problematic in itself. But as a characterization tool, he's all about helping vice. Um, there's an interesting theological aspect here, and I've not seen many people take into account the fact that Polidori was Catholic. And there's, um, there's a slightly interesting flip on the... Um, the theology of the immortal wanderer. So the idea of his, his, is Ruthven's damnation inescapable or is it simply unescaped? So in a lot of these immortal vampires, immortal wanderer stories and vampire stories, as we've seen with some of the examples just now, there's a sense in which death can be an exit um, and it can be a salvific moment, allowing the, the soul to be free. But here, excuse me, death offers no exit. It's, it's a continual resurgence of life. So it's death, life, death, life, and it offers no exit. And it appears therefore to, to produce quite a pessimistic narrative um, and a pessimistic narrative arguably of like Calvinist double election where it's just, you know, doomed to be damned. But I don't think so. And I think that's where we have to take um, Polidori's sort of Catholic background into um, consideration. Because Ruthven's evil is a willed evil. There's only one thing that he has to do, which is drink the blood of a virgin every year to survive. Everything else is a choice that he makes, um, an indulgence in this evil. So there's this emphasis on it being a willed evil. It's a victory of the flesh. Um, it's a victory of that sort of sinful self, that evil self, but it's also a willing rendition to the flesh. And this idea of the Catholic theology of... Um, our own activity in the work of our salvation or working out our salvation or not doing so. Um, this idea of a triumph of the flesh isn't just in Ruthman, but all through the text. I've put there on one side, A, an incredibly attractive picture of a vampire, but at the top, I've put um, the list of the sins of the flesh. So it's not just sex. People quite often talk about the sex issue in Polidori, but it's much bigger than that, you know? Um, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Um, but to quote myself <laughs> again, Ruthven is the flesh made manifest and Aubrey's willed subordination to his will suggests both Aubrey's culpability in his own state and his entrapment in the triumph of the flesh. So Aubrey makes the promise to Ruthven and because of the promise that he chose to make, he is unable to stop Ruthven and essentially becomes complicit with the death of his sister. It's only when Aubrey's suffering infected flesh dies that the vampiric curse's power over him is undone and his natural death sets him free. The flesh, the world and the devil, however, live on.
So um, there's this sense of a vampiric infection occurring in this Byronic tale, but it's not by blood. It's not through the consumption of the victim. It's not through a plague. It is very specifically a moral infection. And we definitely get with these vampiric narratives, this idea of a moral infection, particularly when we're thinking about queer representations of the vampire. And I'm going to use two examples, John Stagg's The Vampire and uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's uh, Christabel. So a queer theology of the vampire is all about this conception of an infectious soul death. As we're moving on into the 19th century, it becomes much more prevalent, this conception, talking about the blood drinking as a perverted Eucharist. But this idea of the vampiric act of blood drinking being a reversal of the Eucharist, which gives life and salvation, and being instead an imbibing of damnation. So um, th these are the biblical verses about what the, the Eucharist is. Um, specifically within um, Catholic theology, of course, is the idea of transubstantiation. You're actually drinking the blood and bread and eating um, the flesh. So that he, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. The opposite of, true, of the vampire. Um, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal death and I will raise him up right now. Um, you also have this... Um, other sort of biblical injunction this the vampiric drinking is the fulfillment of this he that eateth and drinketh unworthily of the blood of christ eateth and drinketh damnation unto himself and so by participating in this perverted eucharist you drink damnation unto yourself um, and it's an infectious corruption that goes on the heretical infection that christopher herbert talks about looks back to old testament infection laws Things like, for example, just by sort of being in the vicinity of a menstruating woman, you were suddenly corrupted and contaminated. Um, but this idea of infectious corruption. So I'm going to take you through into the world of queer theology in the 18th century. And I'm specifically going to be using the text Ananya, which is about self-pleasure, but is more broadly about non-reproductive sexuality. And it makes it very clear that it's also talking about um, uh, homosexual activities as well. And in one of my favorite self-owns of all literature is like, we can't let the women know about masturbation and doing things with each other because then they'd never come back. <laughs> like, <laughs> there you go. Um, <laughs> still makes me laugh that you actually put that in writing. You're like, bro, think it through. Um, anyway. Let me introduce you to Onan and Onanism, if you are not familiar with the term. One of my favorite Bible stories, again, a super proportional response to everything. Genesis 38, 7, 9, Onan is told, you need to marry your dead brother's wife so that he can have a kid through you with her. Great. Um, so he marries her. Um, I don't know what's going on in that picture, but this is a depiction of Onan. Um, and they have the sex, but he doesn't want to have his brother's kid for him. So he finishes to the side and God strikes him down with a lightning bolt. So there you go. Um, so this is one of the key passages used in theological condemnations of masturbation, both in the 18th century and up to the current day, traumatically enough. So um, I'm going to be referencing the sort of theology outlined within Anani or the Hina's sin of self-pollution and all its frightful consequences. Um, it's a text which is allegedly a medicalized text, but what you find with it instead is this mix of the medical with a very clear underlying theological paradigm. And it's that which I'm going to be investigating today and how it relates to the vampiric infection. So content warning, we're getting into the 18th century homophobia. So ask Anania, what is acceptable sex? the carnal commerce of the two sexes for the continuance of the species. Okay, so you're not just talking about self-pleasure, right? So you're just talking about self-pleasure, right? Self-pollution is how they phrase it. And no, all those who have relations with those of their own sex are also included in all of these comments. What happens if you engage in these activities? Well, whenever anyone gives themselves over to uncleanness, they cease to be the temples of the Holy Spirit because the spirit cannot dwell with pollution. So let me break down why that's important for our vampiric knowledges. Basically, this conception of engaging in these activities drives out the spirit and leaves you as corrupted flesh. 
What actually happens to you though is a, an array of exciting different symptoms. Weak calves, my favorite, slack jaw, staring eyes, general weakness. Uh, Roy Porter goes into it in slightly more uh, summarized depth. Constitutional decline, physical weakness, and of course, ultimately in some cases, even death. There's a really interesting and very close mirroring of a lot of the symptoms associated with non-reproductive sexual activity and vampiric uh, weaknesses, as you can see from the Roy Porter quote there. Um, so it's just you, right? Like this will just affect you. No. The refusal to engage in reproductive sex reverses the natural order and able to propagate naturally. The queer subject is given up to uncleanness, dishonor their own bodies between themselves, spreading a moral and spiritual infection. So this conception, you're not engaging in reproductive sex. So what you're doing instead of propagating life is propagating death, propagating corruption. Shocking stuff, but at least we get to say ourselves, right? Right? No, the pollution is not only against nature, but is a sin that perverts and extinguishes nature. So engaging with non-reproductive sexual activity or non-sanctioned sexual activity um, basically turns you into something other. So transgressive sex leads to a physical decline and wasting, leads to pollution of the flesh, the spirit and the soul abandoning the flesh, a spreading moral infection and the perversion of one's fundamental nature. I'm hoping that you can see quite clearly how this maps onto discourses um, of the vampiric. And we certainly find um, a number of examples of queer coded um, vampire poetry in the period. Um, but this vampire poetry, I wouldn't say is an exploration of transgression so much as it is a recapitulation uh, of this specific concept, uh, a theology of the queer that we're finding uh, outlaid quite neatly for us in Onania. So what poems am I talking about? Christabel for a start. If you don't know the story of Christabel, Christabel's out in the woods, meets Geraldine, who appears to be a lady in distress, but gets her into the house. She strips off and there's a terrible wound and she has some sort of hypnotic power over her. But there's certainly this sense of very clear queer undertones in the text. And there's an interesting conception of, it's not a question just of innocence corrupted by um, evil or wrongness. It, there's a sense um, in this text of the inherent fallibility. Um, and also this sense of a condemnation or corruption, which is unwilled either by the subject or the object, by the person creating that, um, passing on that corruption or the person be having it passed on to them. So um, why am I saying it's not just about innocence versus evil? Because there's a willed submission here that's emphasized where um, Christabel is bringing Geraldine in from the forest. Geraldine's like, oh, no, it's weak. And the lady sank for like through pain and Christabel with might and main lifted her up a weary weight over the threshold of the gate. So <laughs> throws her into the castle basically is how I imagine it. Um, but you have this willed engagement here with this potential corruption. There's a transgressive passion that you have here, lightly outlined. While um, Geraldine is undressing, Christabel is laying there in the bed, vain her lids to close, so halfway from the bed she rose and on her elbow did recline to look at the Larry D. Geraldine, or Geraldine, as I would say it. Um, so there's obviously this queer coding going on. There's also this conception of a shared damnation. So Geraldine lies down next to her, suddenly as one defied, collects herself in scorn and pride and lay down by the maiden's side and in her arms the maid she took, a well a day. And with low voice and doleful look, these words did say. So you quite, off, quite obviously have this queer coding, this embrace, etc. but you also have this sense of reluctance, the reluctance to pass on a form of condemnation. Um, and, but it is an infectious transgression. So in the touch of this buzz on their work of the spell, which is Lord of Thy Utterance, Christabel, um, which is obviously uh, within the context of the poem is about the fact that Christabel can't tell anybody that she's seen this wound in Geraldine's side. But um, a queer coded reading of that is incredibly easy. So I will leave that up to you. The second poem with which people might be less familiar, although I did do a read along video, so feel free to look it out, look it up, um, or just read it for yourself as well. 
um, is The Vampire by John Stagg from 1810, one of my favorite poems. Um, and again, one I would say that is very queer coded. Um, so he's laying around being like, oh no, I'm dying. And I'll tell you why, and I can't do anything about it. It's because young Sigismund, my once dear friend, but lately he resigned his breath. With others, I did him attend unto the silent house of death. Young Sigismund, my once dear friend, but now my persecutor foul. Doth his malevolence extend into the torture of my soul? From the dear mansion of the tomb, from the low regions of the dead, a ghost of Sigismund of doth roam and dreadful haunts me in my bed. There vested in infernal guise, by means to me not understood, close to my side, the goblin lies and drinks away my vital blood. When surfeited the goblin die with banqueting by suckled gore, will to his sepulchre retire till night invites him forth once more. And there's a break. This is just the end of the poem, that last bit. And Herman's like, you know, there's nothing we can do. I'm just going to have to die. And then when I've died, I'm going to come back for you, lovely wife. Um, and so he does die. Um, and she sees this kind of uh, very erotic moment of Sigismund over the bed, like leaning over him, sucking away. Um, and he's like, you know, you can't help it. You just have to bury me and then it's over. But she's like, no, I think I'll just kill you both, actually. <laughs> so there's a really interesting, again, emphasis on that willed damnation um, and that ability to resist if desired to do so. Um, so the corpse of Herman they contrive to the same sepulchre to take, and through both carcasses they drive deep in the earth a sharpened stake. By this was finished their career, through this no longer they can roam, from them their friends have naught to fear, both quiet sleep that keep the slumbering tomb. It's a very interesting imagery there, of course. Um, but this queer coding of the poem is not used to explore the possibilities here, although you can you can read it now whatever way you want, but it's quite clearly an engagement with a, a sort of theology of the queer, which is all about um, internal corruption, the ability to resist, the desire not to do so, um, and this sense of it being producing a, an activity that produces an endless death. Um, so... That was the last verse again, but I've got it with a fun picture this time. <laughs> um, vampiric figures proliferates across later Gothic texts, evolving and gaining a palimpsest of overwritten meanings as it does so. Um, so basically, you know, vampires are inspired by previous vampires, inspired by previous vampires, leaving behind many of the earlier meanings, though keeping perhaps some of their markers, some of the tropes associated with them. Um, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about numbers is this specific moment um, and how the queer is represented then, not later. So this particular moment in the early 19th century, the theological residence of the vampire remains clear. Whether the avatar of a rapacious church, the victim of a condemning God, the eternal consequences of a submission to the flesh, a literalization of a damning theology of the queer, or a symbol of condemned religious otherness, the vampire is an infectious agent of spiritual death and embodied damnation. So I've said it's going to go on differently and you'll be aware of all these things. Lots of changes occur, not always in a straight line. Um, the vampire is far from status, static, static, I think you'll find. Um, it goes obviously from villain to anti-hero to hero, often now, from homophobic very clearly to fluid in terms of both gender and sexuality, often now from condemning to prurient, arguably in something like Carmilla, to affirming, literal to figurative monster and back again, a fearful other to a superhuman self. That's the Joseph Crawford theory um, about the progression of the vampire's romantic hero. An anti-Semitic figure very clearly to something that now isn't necessarily tied to a specific religion or ethnicity, from a creature created by theological per perversion um, we talked about this on Thursday, to one defeated by theological weapons in something like Dracula, to one understood through a medicalized discourse and disassociated from theology. And the vampire, however, I would argue, always sits on that boundary between fear and desire, teetering on the line of transgression. So um, <laughs> ask what you please and I will tell you everything, but my story is simply one of bewilderment and darkness. <laughs> it's a quote from Camilla for you there and a picture from Camilla as well, eating a biscuit is what I wish I was doing right now. Um, <laughs> so any questions? So, oh crap, I went over, sorry guys. <laughs>
I thought I was doing so well for time today. It's because I didn't write such a short last section. Fail. But feel free to ask any questions if you have any, of course. Um, I will be very willing to answer them. A ver, a ver. One of my favorite sessions. Ah, oh, thank you. That's my Kofi, if anyone wants it. Oh, also, um, this is super cheeky, but I'm going to put up my Amazon wish list on my, on my Twitter page in case there's some like 99p options on it. So if you don't want to give me any money, you can, and you don't want to get me a book, that's also fine. But if you do, 99p options. There's also like 50 pound options, but like those are not something I'm ever actually going to own. I just like to look at them occasionally. <laughs> like one day I'll steal that from a library. <laughs> not really. Um, when do vampires become so prevalent in pop culture? I mean, arguably probably with Varney. I don't know if anyone has a feel about that, but like Varney the vampire in the 1840s, um, <laughs> early part of the 19th century, was an incredibly popular long running serial. Um, another sort of in the 20th century popularization of the vampire again, and turned into the romantic figure was uh, Dark Shadows, Barnaby Collins on American TV. Um, Dracula obviously took off in terms of inspiring a whole series of films and um, productions. I think like, you see different versions of the vampire becoming popular again at different times um, and in response to particular um, inspiration. So like the vampire of the Hammer Horror movies never really disappeared. Um, like less prolific, less popular, but then like the Barnaby Collins re kind of refocused how the vampire was being portrayed. Um, and then obviously you've got another kind of watershed moment with the popularity of Twilight. And so you keep having these things that restart the trend in a slightly different direction, maybe. Um, could you please elaborate a bit more about the perverted Eucharist in comparison of Kleisberg with vampire blood? Sorry if the question isn't clear. No, I, I mean, I think that's, I, it's a really interesting question and there's quite a lot of work on it. One of the things I didn't talk about today, but I absolutely love Christopher Herbert's uh, um, essay on vampire religion. I think there's this connection to religious othering and there's um, this also this sense that the vampire can be used to target specific religious groups and beliefs. Um, and I think to some extent you see that in the blood drinking. Um, the Christopher Herbert article talks about the way in which it lampoons uh, Methodist hymns which kind of over egg the blood thing from the 18th century like I'm gonna you know drown in a pool of God's blood that kind of thing and I'm gonna bathe myself in the blood of Jesus um, I don't know why I did this but quite like sensualized blood si blood song so there's a sense of I think an engagement that's quite negative potentially with this blood drinking um, but I also think there's like the quite clear sexual element, which is not associated necessarily with the theology of the Eucharist, which makes the blood so uh, prominent, but then becomes easily readable as a perverted Eucharist. Um, and, but I think it's interesting, particularly when you think about how often it's Catholics that can defeat vampires, that it's also um, a Catholic, a sort of perversion of the Catholic. So, yeah. Um, I'm watching Buffy again, because I do watching Drag With Me too. There's a big Buffy and I There's a woman in the news recently. Uh, yes, I saw that lady in the news with the Jesus blood coronavirus. It's the hymn's fault. Like some of those hymns are really just not good. Come on. <laughs> like, some of them are really very, very explicit about like splish sploshing in the fountain of Jesus's blood. I'm like, that's not even good theology, guys. Come on. Um, <laughs> you know, this, the little, I was glad that I got to do this today because I was meant to be going to the Reimagining the Gothic Sheffield Conference and my paper was entitled Gothic Wanking <laughs> of the Vampire. Yes. Well, it was initially entitled, I think, Onanism and something, something, the Vampire. Um, but my panel was going to be called Gothic Wanking. It was going to be amazing. But sadly, no. <laughs> 
Oh, thank you for posting the vampire religion. I think it's really interesting. Um, have you got any thoughts on vampires and class? Yes, I do. I think um, I totally disagree with Nick Groom and Eric Butler on how they read Polidori, that's for sure. Um, I don't think you can view him as a, an avatar of the middle class, um, Ruthven. I think you can very clearly view him as an avatar of the aristocratic class. And I think that you um, very frequently get that with these early vampires, that they're basically a sort of a, a meta, like a literalization of that metaphor of the blood sucking tendencies of the upper classes. Um, obviously, like it gets more and more complicated as you build on the myth, you know, and you have that return to the folkloric roots where it's quite often peasants that are coming back. So you, I think you, it depends on, you know, what text you're reading. I think the idea of the vampire as an upper class is still really quite prevalent. Um, some ways in a view, in, in, sometimes in a way that makes that upper class monstrous and sometimes in a way which is quite sycophantic and gross. Um, yeah, I would be what I would say just off the top of my head. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. Like vampire, vampire Marxism. Again, I think like I keep recommending, um, horror vanguard to people. Um, yes. Sorry. When I said Polidori isn't middle-class Polidori. Yes. Is Polidori is in that position where he's looking up at the Ruthven that he creates as aristocratic and hating him. Um, I don't think like, I, I think Polidori is, is, is from that position of like looking up and wanting to be in that upper class, but also despising it to a certain extent. And certainly that kind of aristocratic Byronism, which is so heedless and destructive. Um, but yeah, vampire capitalism, I think like it's a really common um, sort of discourse that you'll find then obviously being repeated and echoed in more modern iterations, you know? Um, Ah, thanks for that, Frank. Um, I've spoken of this before on Twitter, perhaps, but our Brazilian vice president turned president by a coup was figured in a carnival parade as a literal vampire. Yep. They're a very useful symbol of many things. Um, I think, yeah, like, I didn't really cover it because it's not my area of expertise, um, but there's quite clearly a, a long history of the vampire and anti-Semitism. Um, there's obviously, like, the, the one that's really famous is Dracula and that kind of anti-Semitic coding of his appearance, potentially. But you're getting, like, the use of vampiric language to, dis to discuss Jewish moneylenders in the 18th century. And you're also getting just a, a lot of overlap between kind of vampiric figures and... Jews more generally so it's quite like a it's a it's a trope that was used anti-semitically quite frequently unfortunately which is why it's good that we've moved away from that one hopes I'm sure there's probably still some propaganda somewhere that uses vampiric imagery yes um any other questions I guess is that a yes Mason or is that just a wave Oh, just a wave. Um, I get confused when people put their hands like up, you know. Um, anyway, if, if there aren't any other questions, I will leave. <laughs> um, do remember to fill in the form if you want any more classes. I'm going to be doing dreams, lots and lots of dreams. And um, I'm going to be doing an introduction to the Gothic. Y una versión también en español, si hay alguien que habla español aquí. And um, also... Something about the Gothic romance and Georgia Heyer. So if anyone's a Heyer fan or if anyone wants to talk about Gothic romance and rethinking it, there we go. Cool. Well, thank you very much for coming, everybody. And I will see you again in a couple of weeks. I'm definitely, I'm having next week off except for the book group and the film um, because I need some sleep. Um, but see you in a couple of weeks, maybe. <laughs> cool. See you later. Bye.